Homework 8, Inverse Functions, Video 2. Let's show that a couple of functions are actually inverses. Show that f of x equals 2x plus 1, and g of x equals, oops, didn't write it down, are inverses. But we kind of already talked it through. This is the function I did earlier. Give me a number, I'll double it and then add 1 to it. Give me a 5, I'll double it and make it a 10 and then add 1 to it to make it an 11. What would I have to do that 11 to turn it back into the 5? Well, I would have to undo what I did in the reverse order. It's like putting on shoes and socks. You put on the sock first and then the shoe. When you reverse that process, the last thing you did is the first thing you undo. Last thing I did is put on the shoe. First thing I would undo is take off the shoe. Here, I am doubling and then adding one. So how would I undo that? I would have to take off the one and then divide by two. So my inverse function should be take a number, subtract one, and then divide it by two. Okay, so let's see if these are inverses. We have to do four things technically to show that they're inverses. The first thing is to start with f of g of x and hope that when it all washes out, we're left with just an x. Recall how function composition works. f of g of x literally means f of g of x, and then just go inside out. Replace the g of x with what it equals. g of x is x minus 1 over 2. We still have to put that into f, and now put that into f. f says I'm going to do 2x plus 1 to this. Remember how to take the function value of an expression. Copy the function with parentheses instead of x's. Instead of 2x plus 1, 2 parentheses plus 1. And then fill in the parentheses with the input x minus 1 over 2. Now it looks like a mess, but it's going to clean up real nice. Because look at this multiplication problem. We have times 2 and divided by 2. Those cancel. That leaves in parentheses x minus 1. And I no longer really need those parentheses because there's nothing outside to keep them there. So the plus 1 and the minus 1 do cancel. And look at that. I'm back where I started. I'm left with an x. But that's only 25% of the work to show that two functions are inverses. The next part is to do the composition in reverse g of f of x. Just stay the course and you'll be fine. g of f of x literally means g of f of x. Start on the inside. Replace the f of x with what it equals, 2x plus 1. Now we have to put that into the g function. g says, take something, subtract 1, divide by 2. I'm going to copy the g function, but replace the x with parentheses. And then fill in the parentheses with the contents of these parentheses, 2x plus 1. There's nothing in front of the parentheses keeping them there. That's usually how you can tell when you need parentheses. Either there's something in front or there's a power on it. This has neither. So I can pretty much ignore the parentheses and cancel the ones. Technically, I can't cancel the twos yet because they're embedded in an addition problem, but not anymore. Now the twos cancel. So far, so good. Both function compositions did what they were supposed to do. But the next two things we have to do are compare domains and ranges. We have to compare the domain of f of x with the range of g of x. And I'm kind of abbreviating here, so please forgive me. Now, how are we going to find these domains and ranges? Well, it's a function, and the domain is everything you can put in that keeps it real and defined. But wait a second. Didn't we, prior to spring break, talk about how to pull a domain and range off of a graph? So if I can graph these, I can just look at them and say, hey, there's the domains and ranges. And then I can do these two parts simultaneously. Because the fourth part is to compare the domain of g of x to the range of f of x. Again, please forgive me for abbreviating. It's been a long day. Haven't had lunch, and it's 4.30. All right. Um, so in order to pull the domain and range off of both of these functions, let's graph both of them starting with f of x equals 2x plus 1. Uh, we can graph this by cranking out values, but if you were paying attention to a previous homework, this is in slope-intercept form, and I can capitalize on that. The y-intercept is 1, 
the slope is 2. I can interpret that as 2 over 1 and interpret it as rise over run, which means from the intercept I can run 1, rise 2, put a second point, and connect them to make the graph. Now it's not perfectly accurate, but it's accurate enough for our purposes, which is to pull the domain and wrench. The domain here goes forever in both directions, negative infinity to infinity. Then again, it was a polynomial function that was destined to do that. The range is bottom to top, forever in both directions. But what about the other graph of g of x? We'll do that one in green. Equals x minus 1 over 2. That doesn't look like it's in slope-intercept form. But the truth is, I can make it in slope-intercept form. I just have to give it a little makeover. I'm rewriting the f function in red so it matches the red graph. How is this in slope-intercept form? Split it into two fractions. x over 2 minus 1 half. And then rewrite x over 2 as 1 half x minus 1 half. So it is in slope-intercept form, and I can take advantage of that. The y-intercept is negative one-half. So I wasn't too accurate when I drew the first line, so I need to be a little bit more accurate. If this y-intercept was one, I have to find the space of one to be about that much. So negative one is down there, one -half, negative one-half is about there. But what about the slope of the second function? It's one-half, rise over run. So, unlike over here, where I rise 1 and run 2, here I'm running 2 and rising 1. So, if I run 2 and then rise 1, remember I'm down a half, so rising 1 will put me up there. Then I get this line. Whose domain and range are both um, negative infinity to infinity. For this domain and range here, I'm just going to subscript them with an f to indicate that that was the domain of f and the range of f. I know I'm all over the place with the notation. I'll blame it on the lack of lunch. Um, for the domain of g, well, this green line goes forever left and right, so negative infinity to infinity. And for the range of g, which I'll call rg, goes forever bottom and forever top, so negative infinity to infinity. So yes on both of these. Every domain and every range is the same for both functions, so what I need to match matches. So those are inverse functions, and honestly, I think they were going to be checking the domain and range is almost more of a formality. You can almost just get away with the first two. When can you not get away with the first two? I'll show you in the next example.